Hello, uh, this is Gordon Johnson, Extension Fruit and Vegetable Specialist with the University of Delaware. I'm going to cover a number of our research projects in 2020 in fresh market vegetables. We'll start off with our seedless watermelon variety trials. When selecting varieties, we're looking for yield, size distribution with 45 counts being usually the most desirable appearance, a nice dark rind, uh, and resistance, disease resistance. Uh, of course, we also are um, interested in uh, when they mature, uh, how long the uh, season is with the variety, uh, soluble solids or sugars, flesh density, uh, the absence of hollow heart, plant vigor, those would be other issues. For disease resistance, we're looking for fusarium and anthracnose resistance in particular. And for that rind color, we like a dark stripe, not a solid dark, dark stripe type. That's a crimson sweet type of look, but all with dark rind stripe. So uh, we've been conducting uh, these trials yearly since 2016. In all five years, fascination has been in the top yielding group, being uh, number one or number two in the last two years. Uh, for five years, we've included uh, other standards such as 7187 and Crunchy Red. Uh, we have, don't have those in this year's trial, but they were in the drop group for five, for uh, five years, as was Maxima from uh, Orgy. You can uh, download uh, the reports at the site that you see there, uh, or you just type in Google University of Delaware Vegetable Variety Trials and it'll take you there. Uh, right now, uh, you can see the 2019 seedless trials and many seedless trials will have the 2020 up uh, in about a week. So for 2020 variety trial information, we had 31 uh, varieties from nine companies, including Syngenta, Seminus, Origene, Cicada, Seedway, Enzazad, Highmark, Known You, uh, Kaiwanese Company, and Nunums. We had three replications in a cooperator field right next to our research station. We used nine plant pots, plots with four SP7 pollinizers in each plot. We uh, transplanted in a uh, greenhouse in late April. I mean, we seeded uh, in trays in a uh, greenhouse in late April and then planted uh, transplants out on May 22nd. It was harvested four times. We take individual weights, soluble solids, hard seed, and hollow heart uh, measurements or ratings. In our 2020 top group, uh, you can see again fascination being our industry standard right now, uh, being number two, uh, two of the origin varieties, 6406B, 6375A, also being high yielding. A uh, number of the Syngenta varieties, uh, including uh, several of the numbered WDL lines, 8415, 6421, 8423, all above 100,000 pounds per acre in this trial. Other uh, Syngenta varieties include, of course, Fascination, uh, Captivation, Exclamation. Those are uh, examples. We had uh, red amber from Enzazaden being over 100,000 pounds, as well as Kingman from and uh, Charismatic from Cicada uh, and uh, Shoreline from Simonis. So this is uh, what some of the uh, the two origin varieties looked like: nice dark uh, striped rind pattern, uh, beautiful dark red interiors, very solid uh, flesh. The uh, WDL varieties, this happens to be 8423, uh, 8415 was also in that top group. Some of the uh, varieties we've had in for a number of years, Excursion and Charismatic, Red Amber being the Enzazaden variety and Shoreline from uh, Seminus. And we did have one uh, yellow uh, seedless end of trial, Orchid Sweet, from the No Nude Seed Company. Our second group, over 80,000 pounds per acre, you can see included our standard from Menem, 7197. Then Guardsman, uh, you can see to your right as a 
Seedway uh, proprietary, as well as Cracker Jack. Those two are available through Seedway. Uh, again, a uh, number of the WDL numbered lines in this group, as well as uh, Joy Ride uh, from Simonis. Fruit weights were uh, lower than they have been in past trials. We had a, a real pretty uh, heavy fruit set, so that meant that we carried a lot more melons per plant, and therefore we had uh, a lot of smaller melons or 60 count melons. But uh, the three of the WDL numbered lines uh, were above 15 pounds uh, average weight, as was Joyride and Fascination. Um, as far as our counts, uh, those with over 30% 45 counts are listed here. And that includes most of the ones that we would expect, such as uh, Fascination, Captivation, and Charismatic. Uh, and you can see, however, that we did have a uh, fairly high number of 60 count watermelons. Those with over a third of the melons uh, being harvested on the first date are seen in the, uh, the table to your left, uh, where uh, we have the WDL 8415, 7408, and 6429 in that group, uh, as well as Joyride and Excursion. Uh, as far as those that had over 25% at harvest date three, uh, showing extended harvest. These would include the 6375A from Origin, uh, WDL 6421, Guardsman, Joyride, be uh, examples there. The one variety that they had extended harvest into the fourth harvest date was 7197. Number per acre, uh, the varieties that are in white are smaller size or 60 uh, to 90 count watermelons. Uh, so these, some of these are, uh, would be considered mini watermelons. But as far as those standard varieties, uh, uh, seedless varieties, ORS 6406B had far more uh, watermelons than uh, a lot of the other varieties. Sugars were low in 2020. Summer Breeze and Joyride were the only two with over 11 uh, bricks. Hollow heart, uh, several of the known new varieties had high levels of hollow heart. Uh, these, uh, this may be because of uh, not having adequate pollen. They may be an early flowering type. So we'd have to look at them another year with different pollinizers to see if that corrected this defect. Moving on to broccoli, we had variety trials in the spring and fall at Georgetown. We uh, transplanted in April 29th in, this, in the uh, spring trial. Again, this is a late, we don't normally wanna transplant that late, uh, but in this case, we uh, were able to get this in before the COVID, complete COVID shutdown. And so um, we were able to get that extra heat stress. So again, a good test. Fall transplant dates, rut smack in the middle where we normally would like to plant, which is, this is August 15th. Eight varieties, a commercial and four uh, in the spring and nine varieties fall with experimental and ex commercial types. We plant on white plastic mulch, double row with one foot between plants in the row, uh, drip irrigated with approximately 160 pounds of nitrogen. We had four replications and the uh, spring trial was harvested in June and July. The August, uh, the fall trial was harvested in October and November. We take uh, information on the number of marketable types and unmarketable culls, weights, uh, and then we also look at defects and diseases. So in our spring 2020 broccoli trial, Eastern Crown, uh, has been our most consistent in the spring planting. Uh, gave us good commercial yields with about 79% uh, marketable. Anything over 400 boxes per acre is considered uh, a good commercial yield for us. 
followed by Emerald Crown, which is again a standard. Both are from Cicada and Imperial also from Cicada. Uh, following that Millennium, uh, which we've had good luck in the spring in the past, did not perform as well this year. And then the other varieties purported to have some heat tolerance, just did not perform under this late, uh, in this late planting, late uh, April planting. In the uh, fall 2020 broccoli trial, we had one of the experimental lines. Uh, you can see two of the experimental lines you can see to your right, 16-3-13 uh, and 65XP13. They all had uh, very nice looking heads, uh, well domed, tight beads, uh, and looked promising uh, with 16-3-13. Uh, uh, having uh, over 400 boxes per acre yield. Emerald Crown and Eastern Crown, again, are standards, uh, particularly Emerald Crown for fall here. And then uh, the other numbered varieties having lower yields with uh, uh, 60, uh, the 61 and 55 having uh, low 200 boxes per acre. So, uh, neither one would be commercially acceptable uh, in our area. So looking at uh, some of the issues with uh, those varieties, unevenness. So again, this is, uh, our, we're a part of the Eastern Broccoli Project and we'd like to thank them particularly for the fall trial and our participating companies. Finishing up, we're going to look at uh, some of our horticultural practice to, to manage stress, starting off with tomato and pepper. One of our issues is we're getting warmer nights in the summer. This has effects on our crops and, uh, and uh, putting extra stress. Uh, heat and drought uh, will reduce overall yields in peppers and tomatoes, uh, oftentimes due to reproductive failure as well as low, lower photosynthesis. Uh, we'll have quality issues, shape, uh, size and shape calls or internal defects and just loss of crops uh, as far as flowers dropping off. With tomatoes, if we get over 100 degrees for two days, we'll have entire fruit set failure in most varieties. If it's above 95 day or 80% night, and we'll have reduced pollen production against re uh, reduced fruiting and above 75 degrees at night, we have problems with pollen tube growth and we'll get uh, lower set and we'll get uh, poor quality. If we have really high humidity over 90%, we have problems with pollen shed and clumping in tomatoes. You can see here a picture from Jerry Bruce, my colleague at the University of Maryland, uh, where we've lost on that truss, we've lost three of the potential fruits due to heat. Incomplete pollination will lead to angular fruits, lack of gel or hollow areas, like in photos from Jerry. But we're seeing other quality issues uh, increasing over the last seven years in our region with these internal defects, uh, this white tissue development. Also increased yellow shoulders or blotchy ripening. These disorders uh, seem to be uh, re uh, related to both uh, soil temperature uh, under in black plastic mulch production as well as potassium uptake. Uh, and because of these high soil temperatures, the root systems aren't functioning properly and we don't get proper potassium uptake, which causes uh, this, uh, this uh, disorder, white tissue disorder. So the fruit can look normal on the outside and have severe interior defects. Uh, so uh, we conducted another trial in 2020 uh, with tomatoes to look at uh, this heat tolerance uh, for uh, white tissue development. We had 22 varieties using five plant plots for five harvests. And we transplanted in June, so we get heat on it uh, and uh, we also took yields, uh, but rated for white tissue. 
just to remind, uh, we had a similar trial out in 2019, the yields, the yields were down this year. We had uh, a lot of splitting. Uh, we had some issues with some herbicide damage in the plot also. Uh, but uh, the varieties that did well last year were still on the top this year, but uh, with about half the yields, with Grand Marshall being uh, on the top both years. White tissue last year, we saw a lot of varieties that had severe white tissue uh, in the first uh, first sets. Uh, and uh, you can see here varieties such as Camaro had uh, essentially all, all the uh, Camaro and the 61, 63 uh, and Red Snapper had, all tomatoes had uh, some level of white tissue in them. Uh, when you get into the later harvests, uh, we saw the white tissue drop off as the temperatures went down. Uh, but we did have some varieties uh, with Mount Fresh being an example uh, and Myrtle uh, continuing to have some white tissue problems even in these when the temperatures were cooling down in September. In 2020, uh, we saw similar problems with Camaro uh, having very uh, uh, high white tissue uh, overall, over all the harvest dates. Uh, those varieties that had uh, less white tissue included uh, Red Mountain, Red Bounty, Scarlet Red, and XTM 6218. Again, just looking at uh, Primo Red would be a standard in our area. Uh, and uh, Red Mountain, Red Bounty, they looked like. Other ways that, other than variety selection that we look to manage heat included a lot of the different things you see uh, on the slide, including changing mulch colors, uh, shading, radiation blocks, uh, evaporative cooling. So the one that I've researched consistently uh, over last decade with different crops has been use of particle films for stress reduction. And particle films are white coatings that are applied to the plant uh, that reflect away some of the excess radiation. We have those that are clay-based or kaolin-based and those that are lime-based or calcium carbonate-based. So these are products I've looked at for a, a number of years. Uh, the calcium carbonate-based would be per shade and reflections. Uh, the kaolin or kale uh, clay based would be screen duo or surround. <laughs> Last year, uh, or 2019, we had uh, many days in the 90s. So in July, uh, we had a similar, uh, similar uh, effect this year with many days over 90 in 2020. And so what we did was we sprayed these materials onto the plants and looked at what effect uh, they would have on white tissue development. So, and we also took yields. So uh, in the case of our uh, white tissue ratings and on yields, uh, we did not see any uh, major effect on overall yields with these materials. Uh, we did see uh, some effect of uh, reduction of white tissue particularly when we we're using uh, the uh, per shade material and showing how we would break these for white tissue. Uh, we had also uh, looked at uh, particle films for watermelons. Uh, and in 2019, we saw a uh, increase in watermelon weights in crunchy red, which is a somewhat heat sensitive variety compared to other watermelons. And then in Troubadour, which is not so heat stress uh, susceptible, we did see uh, with just one of the materials per shade. Uh, so per shade worked on both uh, uh, varieties. Uh, and then the other uh, particle films increased uh, watermelon weights in uh, 2019. Unfortunately, in 2020, we did not see the same effect. So I'm not showing that here, but looking at the data, uh, we saw no uh, 
effect of you know, applying particle films. So we improved yields in 2019, but in 2020 did not improve yields with particle films. So this is my contact information. Uh, and we thank you for uh, listening uh, to this presentation.